Let's, let's walk through this legal to go and see what you guys came up with as far as are we legal to dispatch a flight? So, um, so I'll, I'll start us off the next, uh, the next question we're going to, I'm going to have somebody else. I'm going to call on somebody else to kind of walk us through it, what answer they got and how they got it. Um, but anyways, <clears throat> so our ETA here is 0200 Sulu. So first we need to determine whether or not we're legal to dispatch the flight. Okay. What are we looking at when we're talking about legal to go for a flight? If it's at minimums or above. At okay. The, uh, so what in particular on the minimums? 200 foot ceiling and a one half mile, one half statute mile. Okay. So when we're determining legal to go, the only thing that we're looking at is the visibility. Okay. So we don't, we don't care about the ceilings at all. Um, so I remember you saying, what was that? I remember you saying that now, but I've forgotten just about everything else. Too. <laughs> well, that's, that's why we're reviewing it here. So, all right. So if we go down through the list, just taking a quick look at our, our, TAF here, looking at only the visibility, we can see that every single line is at or above our landing minimums of one half mile. So we know that whatever ETA may be on any one of our questions, that we have legal to go uh, because we have the visibility at or above our landing minimums on every single question. Okay, so every single question, is it legal to dispatch a flight? Yes. So now all we have to worry about is do we require an alternate? So let's see, um, Liz, what, how do we determine whether or not we need an alternate airport, a destination alternate? The one, two, three rule. Okay. And um, what is what is the one, two, three rule? An hour before or after, 2,000 foot ceiling, three mile visibility. Correct. So when we talk about ceilings, can you define what a ceiling is? <clears throat> I sure can in just one second. The height above the Earth's surface of the lowest layer of clouds that is reported as broken, overcast, or vertical visibility. Perfect. Okay. So when we look at our ETA of 0200, the first thing that we got to do, so the one represents an hour before, an hour after. So, that in mind, what is the hour before, hour after, also known as the ETA window? Uh, 0, 100 and 0, 300. Okay, perfect. So looking at the TAF above, what line do we need to look at to determine whether or not we have 2,000 foot ceilings and three miles of visibility? It's the, um, the one directly under TAF, the second line. Yep. So second line here is the line that we're going to be looking at. So 
Uh, is there anywhere else that we need to look? For this one, no, because uh, 0, 0100 is the start of that one hour window before and after for this flight. Mm -hmm. So we're just looking at uh, that one line. Yep. And the next forecast doesn't come out until 0, 0700, right? So we're within our entire TAF or ETA window falls within that one line on the TAF. So do we require an alternate? So the 2,000 foot ceilings and broken, or I mean, uh, and the visibility. No. Okay, good. <clears throat> so we don't require an alternate because at our ETA, an hour before, an hour after, also known as the ETA window, we have four miles of visibility, which is greater than the three miles, and we have 2,000 foot ceilings or better um, in, in the line that we're looking at, so in the forecast. So that being said, we are, or we are legal to dispatch the flight, and we do not require an alternate. Okay. Good. So let's see. Cody, why don't you walk us through this next one? Okay. Um, oh, whoops. I just logged out of that page. All right. So is it legal dispatch? Yes. Okay. And then, um, let's see, 0700. So then that's the second one down. And we sh do not need an alternate because the ceiling is, or the ceiling is 30,000 and the visual range is five miles. Okay. So what is our ETA window? Um, oh, 700. Or the window, so the hour before. Oh, hour. Sorry, six, sorry. Yeah, sorry, 600 to 800. So what lines are we looking at uh, on the TAF? The, the second one down. So this one? Or the third one down, I guess. Sorry, I wasn't counting the first one. <laughs> Okay, so we're looking, we're looking at this line. Is there another line that we'd be looking at as well? No. All right, so where does that fall? Well, I guess it falls in the first line, doesn't it? Yeah, so it falls in this line. So zero six hundred prior to zero seven hundred. Remember these forecasts are from. Let's let's just write it down here. So this from the ninth at o one hundred Zulu is from zero one hundred to oh. zero six fifty nine. That's how long that forecast okay. Okay. I was in my mind I was thinking the one two three row would only last for I got it yeah okay so so remember that the hour before and the hour after we got to account for all the forecasts that falls within that ETA window it could be three lines long you know we we may need to look at a total of three lines to get our our, uh, do we need an alternate answered? So, uh, one other thing was, what altitude is that? 3,000. Yep, 3,000. So, I said 30. <laughs> <laughs> so, so <laughs> as for this line, um, as for this line, there's not even a ceiling, right? So 
Scattered clouds, we don't consider a ceiling. Um, we only consider broken, overcast, or vertical visibility as a ceiling. So, um, <clears throat> but yeah, you're correct. We do not need an alternate because both lines, um, we have at least the 2,000 foot ceilings and three miles of visibility. All right, good. So, let's see. Rex, do you want to walk us through this next one? So, 14Z is our ETA. So the so the ETA window is 1300 Zulu to 1500 Zulu. <clears throat> so we'd be looking at the third line down uh, from uh, the ninth at 1200 Zulu. So um, just real quick. So this this always counts as a line, just so everybody knows. So I'm guessing that you mean this line. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah the okay. from 1200 Perfect. Zulu. Um, and uh, during that period of time, there, it's four statute miles of visibility and a ceiling because it's overcast of 2,000 feet, which <clears throat> um, meets our one, two, three rule. So we do not need an alternate and we can, we are legal to dispatch. Perfect. Any questions on that? So like you said, the 14 through 15 all fits under this one line, okay? So we just look at this forecast to determine whether or not we need an alternate. So, good. No, we do not. Let's see. All right, and... Hmm. Jeff, you want to take a stab at this one? Sure. All right. Okay, looking at our ATA at uh, 1430 Zulu um, and referencing the forecast in Salt Lake, we are legal to go. Um, it is on any of the forecasts. We're not seeing anything below our minimums, um, but we're going to reference the two bottom um, that that the forecast for 1200 Zulu and 1500 or 1700 Zulu. Okay. And because um, that would be our our window would uh, involve the forecast during those two lines. Yep. So what's the uh, ETA window? <clears throat> The ETA window is 1430 Zulu, so that would, for the so we'd have to look at the 1200 Zulu, and the 1500 or 1700 Zulu both. So, so the ETA window, you sure? Oh, why do I keep saying 1430? In my mind, I'm saying 430. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not adding the Zulu. Thank you for yeah. bringing my attention to that. Can you see what I'm doing? <laughs> yeah. All right. So at 1630 Zulu. Our ETA window is? That uh, we would have the bottom line to reference. That right. Let's see, 16. Right. Yeah. So, so our ETA window is 1530 Z. Uh-huh. To 1730 Z. Okay. So, so again, we're, we will still reference the, those two at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one that's going to be our fact, the one that we're going to have to factor in the most is the, the one at 1700 Zulu. And um, we are at minimums for our 
visibility of a ha half a mile and the broken layer is above minimum but as a result being right at the limits we need to have a they're both underneath our one two three rule we do need an alternate okay good i made it harder than it is but we got there <laughs> yeah <laughs> sorry no you're good so as far as legal to go once again caught it there Yes, we're legal to go. Even though we're at half mile visibility, we are legal to go because we are at or above our landing minimums. Okay, it's only when we fall below the landing minimums. Okay, and then as far as the one, two, three rule, when we need to dis to figure out. So actually for legal to go, um, I'm sorry. Legal to go, we don't even look at an ETA window. We look at the ETA only. So our ETA actually falls in this line. Okay. Our ETA only falls in that line. <clears throat> Does everybody see that? So at our ETA, we're actually well above landing minimums. So not really a concern. So um, when would we impose or when would we invoke that, uh, the window? When does it become important to say, well, we've got to consider the window? Only when we're deciding whether or not we need an alternate. That's the only time we look at an ETA window. Thank you. So, yeah. So, uh, so as far as legal to go, it's all right there. Okay. Um, As far as needing an alternate, um, definitely, because our ETA window goes from 1530 to 1730. So our ETA window falls onto that line as well. And so that's below 2,000 foot ceilings and three miles visibility. <clears throat> so yes, we would require an alternate. So both of these are going to be yes. So I'm going to throw a curveball at you guys here. And try to make you think a little bit about this. Let's say this goes down to an eighth. Are we legal to dispatch? No. Yes, yes we are. Yes. yes, we are legal to dispatch still. Okay. Um. That being said, do we require an alternate? Yes. Yes. Okay. Our ETA window, even though this is an eighth and well below our landing minimums, um, that doesn't matter. Um, no, I was. I'm, that's right. What was that? I was. Uh, it's sixteen thirty, right? So it should be the line above that. Yep. I was looking at the, I was seeing the bottom line, right? Yep. So, so 1630 falls in that top line. So even though 30 minutes later, they're expecting it to go down to an eighth mile, we're still legal to dispatch. Um, the only thing it does is requires that we put in an alternate. Now, in the real world, if I saw it dropping down to an eighth mile 30 minutes after I was supposed to be getting there, I'd make damn sure that my alternate was a solid alternate because there's a good chance that they may need it. Um, it's easy to pick up 30 minutes of delay, whether it's before the flight or, or uh, in route, you know doesn't matter we or a combination of both there's a fairly decent chance that that it may need to use that alternate um, the other thing to think about there is you know these TAFs believe it or not we get a lot of TAF amendments where weather moves in ahead of schedule um, you know, 
it may say that um, it may say that it's not expected to roll in until 1700 Zulu, but but yeah. So in the video that we just watched, I got a little confused because at the end, near the end of the video, the guy was talking about the wind gust. Mm -hmm. And that he saw if there's a wind gust, he basically tells his pilots it's a no-go to fly. And so that's why when I saw that last line, I was like, well, there's wind gusts. And so I put no, it's not legal to go because of that. But mm -hmm. <clears throat> So that's that's probably my bad. That video is uh, a private pilot course, and he's a he's an instructor for a private pilot course. Well, for a for pilot training um, in the commercial airline world. Even in my Cessna 172, I've landed with 22 knot gusts. Um, but in the commercial world, we're consistently landing in 30 plus knot winds. Um, I've even seen gusts of up to 50 miles an hour and we've still landed. Um, what we need to take into consideration is what direction our runway is heading and if it's a crosswind or not. Um, but still, as far as dispatching goes, and legal to go is concerned, the only factor that we look at and consider is going to be the visibility. Okay. Other than that, it's like good dispatching, right? I'd look and I'd see, you know, we're landing 30 minutes before that eighth mile. I'm going to put on hold fuel and a good alternate. Okay. Um, I see the, the gusty winds. If that's a crosswind on my runway, let's say that my runway's, you know, this is a 260. Let's say that my runway is a 18. I'm going to be landing on the 18s. That's a direct crosswind. I probably put a, you know, make sure that my hold fuel took into consideration the gusty winds as well. And uh, because they may need to go missed because a gust of wind hits them right as they're on that, that final approach and, and throws them off course. They may need to go around and then attempt the landing again. So, anyways, we've talked in the past about. Uh, flights from Salt Lake to St. George and you don't often, at least I don't remember seeing um, them refuel the plane. Did, did you say that normally you load it for a round trip because of because of how short that distance is? Um, no, it, round trip doesn't typically cons uh, take into consideration the distance. Um, I mean, it, it does weigh in just a little bit, but um, typically the only reason why we add fuel at our departure airport um, for our return leg is because the major airline is, you know, whether it's Delta or American, has told us that they'd rather, they prefer the fuel pr prices in Salt Lake over the, the fuel prices in St. George. And so they would make us tanker that flight, but but they they do fuel the planes down here in St. George. It's just they're really fast at it. <laughs> but, Thank you. Yeah. But anyways, um. Any other questions on this video, or I mean this uh, this worksheet?
All right. Any questions on METARs or TAFs? Or NOTAMs or PIREPs? Um, all right. Well, let's take a 10 minute break. And uh, after the 10 minute break, we'll start another legal to go worksheet. And then we'll go from there. You guys believe it? Three weeks left of this. I'm thinking of it as a lifetime of it. Yeah. So I tried using Google Chrome and then I opened up my drive in Google Chrome and I'm still getting the same thing. Oh, really? Yeah, I, yeah. I really don't know what's going on there. It says uh, Word experience an error trying to open the file, try these suggestions, and then like check file permissions, make sure there's sufficient memory. So and then open the file okay. text recovery converter. Try opening up the original here. Go. So go into your main window here, go to legal to go worksheets and try opening up number two in there. Yeah. And and try that one. I I have no idea what's going on there. I've never had anybody you know have that issue. So I don't know where to go. It says unable to convert a document when I try to open it up with Google Docs. Okay. I don't know what, but it works fine through the email. That's what I don't understand. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me get it emailed to you. have it here somewhere. Um, let me open up my finder here. Where this folder disappeared to. All right. 
you like me to copy and paste the document into an email for you? No, I've got it. I was just looking for, I've got a whole folder of several of these that I've made. I was just looking for that folder. I found it, but just don't know how it got to where it was. So. All right, there you go. <clears throat> so this is worksheet number two. <clears throat> So everybody, we're, we're, so first thing that we need to do is get our landing minimums and where do we go to, to do that? On the bottom right corner of the appropriate runway. Okay. I'm looking okay. at it. But I don't see them on the, the flight chart. So where are you looking? I'm on page 28 of 38. The upper right-hand corner says runway 24LR. There is not a separate page for 24R. I have a separate page for 24R. What, what airport are you looking at? Are we looking at LAX? Mm -hmm. What page number are you on? I'm on page number... Oh, I see. You it's got just it? not very clear. <laughs> yeah, 36 of 38. So this one right here. Right? 24. Yeah. Yep. yep. <clears throat> I wasn't expecting color. <laughs> All right. So, what would our landing minimums be? Two hundred foot ceilings and half mile visibility. Perfect. <clears throat> so just like last time, right? I'm sorry, I'm a little bit behind. Tell me where where do I find that uh, deck of airport so, information? So go into your Google Drive. Remember, all of our jet charts are going to be found here. So flight planning, double click on that. And then double click on the Jefferson charts. And then go to Los Angeles. <clears throat> so right here identifies the airport, KLAX. And go into the yeah. Los Angeles charts there. Thank you. And then all we're doing is we're scrolling down until we find the instrument approach plate. So is this an, an instrument approach plate? Anybody? No. Nope. That's a, what is it? A different one. Well, it says it on the chart, so. It's a star. There we go. Okay. Is that an instrument approach plate? No, that's a SID. There we 
go. That one. Uh, what do you classify those as? Just These are airport familiarization charts. So we call these 19s. So this is a chart 19. Just kind of shows you what you're looking at. Yeah, so this is like 2-5 left and right. This is, if you were on the approach into 2-5 left and right, this is what the airport should look like. <clears throat> so, um, you know, the reason why they do these charts is because we, when, again, when I was younger, when I was a kid, they landed a 737 uh, at South Valley Regional Airport by my house um, because the pilot said that he thought it was Salt Lake International. Um, apparently, he wasn't looking at his approach plates because there's only one runway at South Valley Regional, whereas here, you know, there's actually five runways, but well, five strips of pavement. But, yeah. So this just helps the pilot visually see what the airport should look like. All right, so this is where our instrument approach plates uh, start. Um, then all we have to do is, once again, looking up in the top right-hand corner, we just have to find the runway that we're, uh, the instrument approach plate that we're looking, or that we're going to be using. So 24 right. Zoom in there. And our landing minimums, we're going to use the straight-in landing. For runway two four right. And then since we have a full ILS, because there's no notums on there, right? We're gonna use the full ILS, which is two hundred and one half mile visibility. Okay. Oops. So it is one half. We don't have to round up anything there. No, because as long as it's in quarter mile increments, because that's what our weather reports are going to be in is quarter mile increments. And that's the reason why we use those quarter mile increments is it matches our weather. So Um, so let's see. So if that's our Um, landing minimums, what are we looking at and considering when we consider legal to go? The visibility. Okay. And we need half mile or greater, right? Correct. So is there anywhere in this TAF that we don't have a half mile visibility? In the tempo, it's the fourth mile. Okay. Right there. Okay, so we just need to be cautious and we need to evaluate each one of these as we go through them, right? Make sure yep. that our ETA doesn't fall in that tempo. All right. Um, So, 
So let's see here. So our ETA is at is on the eighth at twenty three hundred Zulu. Okay. So how long is this uh, TAF valid for? First of all. It looks like it was issued on the 8th at 2101, and the last one is on the 9th at 2100. Okay, but so, it, it specifically tells you the validity time of the TAF, what I'm looking for. Because after 2100, on the 9th, what time does that forecast last till, you know? So it says up at the top eight, the eighth at twenty one hundred through the ninth at twenty four hundred. Good. So this is what we call the valid time. This is our TAF valid time. Okay. Um, because and, and like I was saying, we don't know when that would end if it wasn't specified somewhere. You know, let's say we're flying trans. Oceanic, or flying from Saudi Arabia to here uh, to LA, uh, and let's say that our our flight lands at twenty two Z on the ninth. Are, are we valid then? Um, so this is this is where it identifies how long the TAF is valid for. They say it wasn't trans oceanic from the movie Airport. Yeah. Back in the 70s. Yeah. Roger, Roger. That didn't go well. <laughs> I'm not well, talking about uh, Leslie Nielsen. I'm talking about the one that had Karen Black and Charlton Heston. I don't remember that one. That was, that was what the spoof was written off of. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I might have to watch that one. Well, it might not have been, uh, it, it, he might have been in the spoof and less than that's not yet. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> no, no, no worries. So, uh, on the 8th at 23Z, um, what... Are, are we legal to dispatch at 23Z? Yes. Okay. Where are we looking? I'm looking at 8th, 2200, uh, P6, uh, statute miles, so more than six statute miles yep. of visibility. Exactly. So we're above our visibility. So yes, we would be legal to dispatch the flight. Okay. Now we need to go in and evaluate. Do we require an alternate? Okay. So um, what is our ETA window first off? An hour before and an hour after. Okay, and that would be? 22 to 24. All right. Um, okay, so what lines are we going to be looking at? Uh, still the same line. Any others? No. I agree. Everything falls in that one. I agree. So, do we require an alternate with that TAF? Or with no. That one? Good. Where's our ceiling at? 10,000 feet? Uh -huh. Am I reading that right? 
yep. 100, 100 feet? <laughs> 1,000 feet. So, yep, remember that on all of these, there's always three digits after the identifier of what type of cloud obscuration we're going to have. So 100 is what we're seeing here. On every single one of these, regardless of where the digits are placed, we always just add two more zeros. Okay, it always drops off these last two zeros. Okay, so it says zero, zero, two. Add two zeros, that gives us 200 feet. Okay, makes sense? Mm -hmm. So you've got your hundreds, thousands, and ten thousands place. So, okay, am, am I reading that correctly? It's KLAX and from 9 at 5 Lulu. Let's know. Uh huh. At LAX. <laughs> so, I'm going to tell you guys a secret. I use actual TAFs. And then I just changed the name of the airport in order to um, so we have a chart to reference because you guys only have jet charts for certain airports. So I'll manipulate the TAFs. I'll manipulate some of the lines. What's I mean, that's a really good catch, but What's important is just the, the actual TAF. Like, what is it showing? <laughs> I'm sorry. I no, you're good. Be... You're good. Good call, though. You caught my bluff. Although, I don't live too high above LAX. I lived in Ontario. Well, just outside of Ontario. And we did get snow a couple times. But still, that's Ontario. Not quite LAX, right on the coast. <laughs> there isn't 200 feet of elevation difference between that and those two. Yeah. <laughs> but, um,. Yeah, good. Did good there. So, he wants to take a stab at the next one. Let's see. About Tyrell. Uh, yeah, I can do that. So, the ET is at 2 o'clock Zulu. So, your time frame would be from 1 till 3 Zulu. And it looks like the... We are not legal to go because that falls in the tempo on the 9th at 2 o'clock with the one fourth statue mile. Okay, our 2Z. We'll go to this line, correct? Mm -hmm. And first we consider, we call this the main body, right? Okay. So we always look at the main body and determine are we legal to go in the main body? Uh huh. Sure we are. So after that, we see conditional language below it. We always go in and we'll look at the conditional language. This is valid from 0 0200 to 0 0300 Zulu on the 9th. Does everybody see that? Yep. Mm -hmm. So that being said, um, since our ETA falls in this temporary line, it only has a quarter mile visibility, then no, we're not legal to dispatch. Good. Good, good, good. So do we care if it requires an alternate if it's not legal to dispatch? No, we don't. Yeah. 
Don't waste your brain cells on it. So in this situation, would they delay the flight until that tempo expires? Yeah, basically. So what they do is they delay the flight out until the ETA was after 3Z. Okay. Might they might delay it indefinitely because snow in LA means that hell just froze over. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, so for the sake of these worksheets though, I just want it black or white. You know, last class I had students that were like Yes, it'd be legal, but I'd have to delay it till 30 minutes later or whatever it is. I don't want to see all that. I just want to see yes or no. Okay. <clears throat> Good catch on that. But yeah, that's in the real world application. That's exactly what we do. We just delay it out until our ETA fell outside of the not legal time. Um. And then we'd slap an alternate on it with a whole bunch of hold fuel just in case it changed, you know, circumstances changed. So. Um, okay, good. So our ETA on this next one is at 11Z. And I want who hasn't done one already tonight? Eric? Sure, I'll do it. Okay. So eleven Z that would fall on the sixth line down. And the visibility is two statute miles, so that one would be legal to dispatch. And then to see if it's an alternate, we need to look at an hour before and an hour after. So that still all falls on that same line. So uh, 10 Zulu and 12 Zulu. Um, And then we need at least um, two miles visibility, and there is no. Sorry, um, <laughs> I got my CLA and my uh, my visibility mixed up. So we need um, two thousand foot ceiling is what. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, so we don't have that because the overcast is at 1800. So we would need an alternate. Okay. And we don't have the visibility either, right? Because what does the visibility need to be at? It needs to be three statue miles. Good. Good, good. All right, now we got 15Z. I've done the rounds, so somebody volunteer this time. I'll let you guys volunteer. All right, I didn't mean to turn that on. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to turn my mic on. Uh, so 1500 falls right after the 1400. There are five statute miles of visibility, so it is legal to go. Okay. And for an alternate, while the visibility is there, the ceiling is not. 
so you would require an alternate. So what's our ETA window? I'm sorry, I missed that part. You're good. <laughs> 1400 to 1600. Okay. Which falls right here, correct? Mm -hmm. All right, so all of it falls on that line. And we have an overcast layer at 1,200 feet. So yes, we do require an alternate. Good. All right. So Who wants to take the last one on this worksheet? I can do it. So the ETA is the 9th at 2230 Z. So that's going to be the last one on, on there. Um, there's P6 statute miles, so more than six miles. So we're legal to go. The time is going to be from 2130 till 2330. And then we have scattered clouds at 4,000 feet, so we are we do not need an alternate. Good, good. You went too fast, sir. Uh, I'm sorry. Next time, I'll slow down a little bit. <laughs> not just teasing. It's good. So any questions on this one? Nope. All righty. You guys are doing, you guys feel like you're getting a good grasp on it? Yeah, I really appreciate you going through these one by one with us and pulling hairs. <laughs> and the reason why I like want you guys to go through all the information on it and make sure that you're doing, you know, each one of the steps is because um, a lot of times uh, students start thinking way too far ahead of the game. And or they'll start mixing up, um, you know, alternate requirements versus uh, legal to go, you know. So <clears throat> I I want you guys to look at it slowly like that um, until until we get a good confidence level. So, any questions on any of that at all? All right. I do have a question. Uh huh. The very last one, Oops. the ETA is uh, 2230. Uh huh. And um, on the TAF, it said it was only good until 2400. Mm -hmm. What if the ETA was 2330 and we had to go to 2430? Mm -hmm. Would we still look at this TAF or would we have to wait until another one was issued that want until uh, 0100? In the real world or in the class? Yes. Oh. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So we won't ever have this problem in uh, in the real world.
because, um, especially at like Sky West, because we're a regional airline and TAFs are, you know, like we talked about, are issued um, four times a day. And so every time a new TAF is issued, um, it will extend out that, that time. But the TAFs are typically good for 24 hours. Um, at least it may be just a hair less, but, but good. Um, but as far as in this class, I will, I just won't ask you guys if it falls outside of the valid time of the, the TAF, I, it just won't be a question. So, so the answer to your question is you should never have to worry about it. Or if you did see it in the real world where your ETA falls outside the TAF, um, that's probably an outstation and we probably get our TAFs from a, a different weather source rather than um, the National Weather Service. And we just haven't had them update the TAF. So like uh, Hot and Hancock, uh, we actually have WSI. They have their own meteorologists. Um, we have them write the TAFs for us. So WSI is the program we use for, it's an approved weather source for us. Um, anyways. We can call up WSI and have them write a TAF for us. And we would just use that TAF, but it costs us money to have WSI write the TAFs. So we only write the TAFs when it's necessary for us to update the TAF. Technically the supervisors should be ahead of you on that, but sometimes if you're early morning, you might need to call and remind the supervisor, hey, I've gotten a a hot and Hancock um, flight and I need an updated TAF. And then they'd call WSI, get an updated TAF, put it in the system, and you'd use it. So, long roundabout way to answer your question. But if we don't have, so, so let's talk about METARs for a second, though, because we still have to use the information on the METARs to determine legality. So let's look at a METAR real quick. Um, Um, so here you go. So METARs, um, when you guys talked about METARs, um, with Adam and what is his name again? Can't even remember his name. Darren or Derek, I can't remember. Derek, Derek, that's right. So when you guys taught, uh, when Derek was teaching you guys about METARs, did he talk about the five required elements in a METAR? If he did, it went over my head. Please tell us again. Okay. So in METAR, there are five things that are required to be in every single METAR that's ever issued. Okay, so let's just clean this one up a little bit so you guys don't have all that other info sitting around. Okay, so in this METAR, um, whenever we're looking at, at them, this first part 
um, this is the the issue time. This is when the the METAR was issued. Um, so that's one of our our required elements. Um, actually, yeah, yeah. The issue time is one of our required elements, and then the wind here. Okay. Wind is a required element as well. So time the winds the visibility Sky condition, and then um, okay, there's. Can't remember name of the airport. No, so uh, the other two. So, so there's six that I consider to be. And I need to look at my manual because I always uh, make sure that I have all six elements in my. But um, this is your time and ten, or I mean, I'm sorry, your temperature dew point, right? And then your altimeter. Let me see. Hold on one second. So I always, I always count six for good measure because if one of the elements is missing, then um, there's special things that we have to do. And I'm not finding the actual worksheet. That specifies. Five, I don't understand. So what I want you guys to do is memorize the six. So time wins viz because if you're missing one of these elements, then um, you have to find a way to get that report. And if you cannot find a way to get one of these six elements um, the, in the METAR, if one of these is missing, then you have to, you know, try calling the ASOS or the AWOS and getting it from that. And if that's not reporting it, then um, you are not able to dispatch. It is illegal to dispatch to that airport um, if, if one of these are missing. 
the METAR isn't valid because it's incomplete. Does that make sense? Three marks aren't required to be in the METAR. Right. Have you seen that happen before? Yes. I have. Um, in fact, it's happened at big airports a couple times, you know. But what will happen is there will just be like a little glitch in the, the METAR uh, machine itself or in the software when it's... Um, when it's... Uh, putting it on the web or whatever on our approved weather source, you know, kind of like how Cody's computer doesn't like my, my files. Um, for some reason there'll be like a little glitch and it'll leave out a portion. Um, I've had it like that before. Um, I've also been missing wins. If you see zeros there, what does that mean? If, nice, clear, non-windy oh. day. So, so not necessarily sky's clear because remember our sky's clear, right. or our sky condition is going to be over here. But this just means winds are calm, right? They they. I wouldn't say winds calm. I would say light and variable is what it actually means. So winds are light and variable to the point where the METAR machine's not even picking up anything. So <clears throat> so when we see zeros, it's still reporting a wind uh, direction and speed. It's just light and variable, right? Whereas... Um, let's just say it's completely gone like that, then we have a problem. So, yeah. So do you guys feel like you need any more uh, practice on, on METARs? I feel okay with them right now. I'm feeling pretty good about them. Off subject again for planning purposes. Have you uh, discussed Monday? Is that going to be taken as a holiday? No. Yeah, problem. that that that's going to be a holiday. So we'll recognize it. Um. Yeah, no class on Monday. So. Might be a good day to go into. Shadow Dispatch. Yeah, for sure. Just be uh, careful because it's going to be crowded down here in St. George if uh, if you're not from here. So. This is when everybody leaves to go back up. <laughs> all the people from Salt Lake come down here, and all the people from St. George go up there. Pretty much. <laughs>
Yeah, I was looking at flights today, and uh, all the flights were booked out. You down in St. George now? Yeah. Yeah, we were over, everything was oversold by two or three people. And then we'd have uh, the non rev list was, you know, 10 people trying to get on an oversold flight. So, which That's isn't, Im it's not impossible. It's just, I don't like those odds. Especially like, when you're going to St. George. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But you got the, the jump seat, didn't you? I mean, it's still a good option. Yeah. But the problem is that I'm going to St. George. So the chance of there being another dispatcher uh, on that flight is pretty high. So I just, to me, I'd rather guarantee that I get down here then spend two hours in the airport and be told that I'm not able to get on a flight. Then I just wasted two hours and I could be halfway to St. George or further. So, you know. This speakers don't have any higher priority than any other non-rev, do they? Um, no, it's all seniority based. Okay. So... We can look at that real quick. You guys want to see what that looks like? So remember, I got hired by <clears throat> SkyWest in January. So, let's take a quick look here. Who do I bump? In January, we've hired, since January, we've hired 1,810 people. It's pretty good, huh? Mm -hmm. But here's the kicker. Still the bottom of the totem pole. It's one of the fun things, uh, as long as you're talking about this. So. <clears throat> when I went in and shadowed the fir first time, we are talking about uh, hiring priority and, <clears throat> or <clears throat> standby priority. And uh, they said, well, that, that sucks because you're going to be at the bottom of the totem pole. I said, not really, since my wife started 22 years ago. Yeah, exactly. You get to use hers as a dependent. So. Yeah, that's got to be nice for you guys because she's probably number, you know, she probably has exact opposite if I of what I have as far as like who do I bump she probably bur bumps 13,500 plus and probably uh, is only bumped by 1,000 to 1,500 people if that where do you where did you find that information on the SkyWest thing? So on SkyWest online um, be interesting to look at yeah if you go into here and go to the travel page down at the bottom there's a who do i bump icon okay just click on that be interesting yeah but that's only priority over other sky west employees when you fly on mainline carriers you then are below all of their employees correct exactly um, you travel. Yeah, so then I bump all of you because I'm on Delta people's. Yeah. But getting out of St. George, I'm sure sucks for you. 
Uh, yeah, then when I worked there, it was fine. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, in St. George, it's funny because I bumped dozens of mainline pilots. I've even had mainline pilots going for the jump seat, and I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> and they get all pissed off. They don't like a regional airline dispatcher, nonetheless, bumping a pilot from the main line off of a flight. They think that's rude. But do you think I cared when I got to Salt Lake in 40 minutes? Nope. Nope. So. a dog eat dog world down here in St. George. But <clears throat> anyways. Yeah. Um well let's see. So there's something that I was looking at on here that I wanted to go over. Hmm. And I think we already covered it. <laughs> oh, okay. I remember now. So I wanted jump back on SkyWest Online. And go into WSI here. Okay. So we're going to talk about the charts because we haven't talked about the charts. So we use several different charts in dispatching. As you can see here, this is a lot of the charts that we use. Um, we're going to go until 8 o'clock, and then we'll do a dinner break, just in case anybody's wondering. Um, actually, yeah, let's, let's do a dinner break right now. Yay! Um, 8.15, everybody jump back on if they're, if everybody's good with that, so. Okay. I will check your messages. All right, thank you. All right, everybody back. Anybody back? I'm here. <clears throat> well, since we only got 45 minutes, I'm just going to get started here. <clears throat> so let's just go over some of the charts that we see um, that we look at in dispatch here. And we're going to start with air mets. So air mets are weather that is basically anything that is more of a warning, right? It's it's not necessarily 
it's it's a forecast and it's um, typically going to be stuff like um, you know light to moderate it's more of just like heads up you might experience this somewhere in this box <clears throat> but it's typically indicating things that are Yeah, not not classified as as severe, um, and not classified as like a thunderstorm or convective activity. So <clears throat> the three different types of air mats that we see are icing. So these are our icing air mats, um, and this just is telling us um, at what levels and what type of icing we may experience somewhere in these in this area okay so saying that there's a good chance of moderate icing from 11,000 feet to the surface okay um i'm sorry not to the surface 11,000 feet and higher okay uh, up to 260. There we go. 11,000 feet to 260. So continuing beyond uh, 3Z through 9Z. Okay. So it's just identifying when we are likely to see icing in that area and what elevations we're likely to see that at. Um, same here. So the other thing that they're going to show in an air met is turbulence. Um, so we're seeing, once again, in that same area, uh, moderate below 8,000 feet ending um, at 0003 Zulu. Uh, low level wind shear is possible over Boston or coastal waters. Um, the ones in yellow are going to be surface based and the ones in green are going to be at altitude. So 20,000 feet to 36,000 feet. The one thing that I want you guys to really get familiar with is these keys. Um, the keys identify, you know, depending on what color you're looking at, whether it's green, yellow, or white, it identifies what's being <clears throat> pointed out in the box. Okay. Um, so, you know, when we're seeing these yellow boxes, this is going to be low level stuff. The green boxes are going to be higher altitude stuff. Okay. Um, and then the text in those boxes is just identifying the phenomena that we're going to incur somewhere in that area. Okay, or expected to, to see when flying through that area. And the last thing that we're going to see on air mats are going to be visibility. Okay, once again, using the key, this is going to identify areas where it's, they're expecting IFR weather and then other areas where they're expecting mountain obscuration. So there's weather affecting the visibility around the mountains. Okay. Um, so you can see here they're expecting, you know, IFR visibility in Northern California, as well as over Atlanta, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Tennessee. <clears throat> um, and then they're expecting it to, the visibility, uh, to be obscuring mountainous terrain. Uh, in those areas. So it's just identifying where we could possibly see low uh, ceilings uh, at. Okay. So that pretty much covers our air mats. Um, the next chart that we will look at is SIGMET. So this is significant weather. This is when we're going to start seeing things like hailstorms or um, 
let's say, um, you know, severe turbulence, moderate to severe turbulence or moderate to severe icing. So this chart will identify the areas where we're going to be seeing that type of weather phenomena. As you can see right now, there's not a whole lot to look at. So, uh, but it looks very much like the air mat chart. It's just identifying more severe um, weather that the that you see on the air mats. And then we have convective segments. So convective, what is convective weather? Thunderstorms. So thunderstorms, exactly. So convective segments identify areas of thunderstorms, okay? or convective activity. Convective, once again, means warm air rising rapidly. Um, think of it as like a convection oven where you've got a lot of um, heat transfer, you know, circulation going on, okay? Um, which indicates thunderstorms. So this is the areas that we are identifying um, thunderstorms to be occurring. Um, so these are areas that we're typically going to try to route around or try to go around. Um, a lot of these that you're seeing here are patchy enough that pilots will still fly through them. Um, but if there's, if the tops of the clouds are reporting too high or, um, or it's just too turbulent, they'll route them around those areas. So <clears throat> it just depends on, on what the weather's actually doing. But when we see these, we typically are, are a little more cautious about our routing and we're going to make sure that we're not going to put our passengers in, in harm's way, right? We're also going to do things like plan contingency fuel. Um, you know, just in case they have to de deviate from the route that we planned, whether it be altitude or actual route, um, you know, we want to make sure that they're going to have the fuel to get around it and not have to worry about, do I have enough fuel to land now? So uh, that's that's our convective segment, uh, segment chart. So. All right, so this is our surface analysis chart, and this is a chart that you guys should be familiar with. So let's go through and review some of these things that we're seeing on here. So what are these light tan lines? Um, Tyrell. I honestly don't remember the name for the light tan lines. <clears throat> Does anybody know the, the light tan lines? Are those the troughs? Nope. Isobars. Isobars. Exactly. Thanks, Rex. So isobars are identifying pressure gradient. Think of it as like a, you guys know what a topographical map is? You guys look at this. So a topo map identifies the, the gradient or the change in elevation. Uh, this is doing the same thing. It's just the pressure gradient, okay? Um, what do you guys think this symbol is? Which one? This one down here. Or on a tornado. Or on a tornado. The but, uh, hurricane one? Yeah. Yep, that's a hurricane, okay? So there's a hurricane over the Gulf off the... They were calling that a tropical storm earlier today. Yeah, so it it's tropical storm or hurricane is, is what that's identifying. So off the coast of Cancun, Mexico, and the Dominican. Is that Dominican or just Cuba? That's Cuba. Cuba. Oh, sorry. Dominican isn't that down there? I don't know my geography very well. In the uh, no, it's next to Cuba. 
No, I think it's the one next to it because Haiti and the Dominican Republic share the island. Yeah, yeah that's that's what I was pointing at uh, just a second ago. But this is Puerto Rico over here. There we go. Okay. Um, okay. So let's. What's that? The little snake you guys see back there. Or you can also see it right here. Right here. Cody? Is that the oh. Or Eric, whoever it was. <laughs> Somebody said it earlier. Is that the trough? Yeah, that's <laughs> the trough. So what are troughs again? Low pressure. Yep. Elongated areas of low pressure. Exactly. Okay. Um, what is this identifying? Cold front. Okay. And that right there. Is that the uh, occluded front? Is that what it's called? Yep. Do you guys recognize this pattern that you see here? It's okay if you don't. Anyways, that's whenever we see this was probably a stationary front at not too long ago. Um, and when it breaks off like this and we see this rotation back around, that's where we're going to see the occluded front. And that's usually um, we're going to usually see pretty severe uh, thunderstorms in that area. So like right there. Okay, so uh, what's this one right here? Up above the occluded front. Stationary front? Exactly. Okay, and uh, what's this one right here? Warm front. Warm front, good. Okay, that one. <laughs> What are you pointing at? This right here. <clears throat> high pressure, Matt. Yep. yep. So, so high pressure. And what way do high pressures rotate? Clockwise. Good. Okay. And clockwise and down, right? Uh, low pressures. Counterclockwise and up. Good. Yeah. All right. So we pretty much nailed them all, right? Good. You guys will have something like that happen on your practical test. So that's kind of what he does when you're looking at the uh, significant or, or surface analysis chart. So where would you find the dry line? So dry line, there isn't one currently occurring. Usually we see a stationary front. We'll see a stationary front and then it'll turn to a dry line, but a dry line would be, so we typically see them in this area right here, just over the panhandle of Texas is uh, typically where we're gonna see those, so. But yeah, we see, uh, we'll see, oops. We'll see uh, a warm front up above and a cold front. And then we'll see those two converge into a stationary front. And then that's when um, shortly after that, typically it turns into a dry line, so. Good. All right, so weather depiction chart, okay? You're gonna see these funky little symbols on here. What do you guys think those are identifying? Look at the weather that's occurring around them. What do you think they're identifying? Rain. 
close. Something a little more severe than just rain, though. Sleep. So, thunderstorms. So, this is the thin symbol for a thunderstorm. So, we didn't really go over this uh, in the weather. And... Um, I'm going to put a link in, in the Google Drive um, tonight, but it's not 100% pertinent to know all of these symbols, but you'll see symbols like this as well um, and, and several others, but this is just identifying uh, precipitation basically. Um, When we're going over um, these charts here, um, you know what? I think we just need to take a look at it here. It's hard to explain. Typically, you're not going to have to deal with it too much. Um, as far as this chart goes, um, typically all I'm looking at is areas where I'm going to see ceilings. Um, and then as far as these dots go, you know, we're, those just mean rain. So this is moderate. This is, or I'm sorry, this is, uh, this is heavy rain. This is moderate rain. When we see one dot, that's light rain. Uh, there's a symbol for drizzle. What does CIGS mean? So that means ceilings. So that, that's mm -hmm. identifying. If you look at, a down here in the corner here. If you see the blue, that's marginal VFR. So marginal VFR weather means that it's not low enough, the ceiling isn't low enough to classify it as IFR weather, but the ceilings are getting pretty low. So that's like the 2,000 foot to 5,000 foot ceiling range, okay? IFR weather is anything 2,000 feet and below, okay? Um, so this, those SIGs, it's just identifying that we're going to be sealing or seeing ceilings in those areas. Um, but let me, pull up this. This is the wrong one. I just got to find the actual chart that I, I gave to him. So this is one thing that I want you guys to look at. I want you guys to watch these video links over the, the long weekend. Um, this will go a little more in depth over these charts that we're looking at right now. Uh, give you a little bit more information on them. Um, but with a long weekend, it'll be, it'll be good for you guys to look at. And I'm going to give you guys two legal to go worksheets for the weekend. I'll give you numbers three and four. Uh, and then where in the world did that go?
I know that I posted this. Sorry, guys. Might be faster to This is okay. Yeah. So this uh, this link here. That I'm putting in your your Google Drive. This identifies these symbols that we're looking at. Uh, So let's let's take a look at them really quick. So this is the stuff that you guys already know, right? You guys know cold front, warm front, stationary front, occluded front, trough, the squall line. We haven't seen those yet on our uh, depiction chart, though. But this identifies the squall line. And what's kind of nice about this as well is it will give you some of the information about different types of weather we'll see when we see those on the charts. So um, these ones I've never, ever, 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 ever seen. So, um, but basically it's a, <clears throat> a developing front or dissipating front, so uh, just depends on on how it's depicted. So, but anyway, so this is the stuff I wanted you guys to look at is right here uh, for these surface now, or I'm sorry, the uh, prognostic charts. So, if you see here. You've got light, moderate, heavy rain. <clears throat> uh, so I said that wrong. Light, heavy, moderate, or er, light, moderate, heavy. Um, snow is right there. Thunderstorm. Um, if you see the dot above it, that means it's rain. If you see the snowflake above it, that means there's snow associated with it. So thunder snow. Saw that this year in uh, St. George for the first time. Can you blow that up a little bit? Yeah, not bad. Yeah, maybe. Um, so thunder snow and then just no precipitation thunderstorm. Okay. Uh, rain showers, snow shower, drizzle, freezing rain, freezing drizzle, and ice pellets or sleet. We don't really use these charts too much. Um, a lot of the information on these charts we find on other charts and it's easier to read. <clears throat> but if you ever wanted to look closely at these uh, prognostic charts, um, this that's what those symbols mean. Um, as far as getting ready for your practical test, it wouldn't hurt you guys to review this. Um, I don't think he goes too in depth with these, but uh, just remember that the dot means rain, the snowflake means snow, this means thunderstorm, and then whenever we see a symbol above the thunderstorm, 
that's identifying the type of precipitation that's falling. This means shower, this means drizzle, this means freezing, and then once again, identifies the precipitation that we see, and then ice pellets. So it's really, I mean, you really only have to think of seven different symbols. And then basically the bigger the cluster, the, the heavier it's falling, the heavier the precipitation. So pretty simple stuff. That's why we don't really spend a lot of time on it is because we just don't use these charts very much. And it's really easy to just throw that in the memory bank. So, um, here's some other symbols that we might see. Um, whenever we see these peaks, that's identifying turbulence. So that's pretty much all that we, we really um, are concerned about is this identifies turbulence. All this other stuff um, is all identified on the chart already, so I wouldn't waste brain power on the rest of this. So <clears throat> we're going to get into this one a little bit more in just a second when we get to our winds aloft charts, but. Then, you know, once again, the symbols are the same, regardless of the chart. So, um, you know, just just memorize these ones, and you're going to be more than fine. Uh, these ones up here, just just go over those sev seven symbols that I showed you, and that's going to cover you more than sufficient. So. I just don't want you guys to waste time studying things that don't need to be studied uh, because we it's not even a practical dispatch uh, item, you know? So Thanks, I appreciate that. Yeah. So I want to make sure you guys are applying your studies appropriately. Um, once again, just don't. There's no need to, to spend time on that. Uh, glance over it if you want, but not necessary that you guys really spend a lot of time on that. <clears throat> but anyways, that, that will just uh, help you guys when you're looking at, at these prognostic charts and stuff like that. Okay. So let's go into our next chart. This is our TCF. So our TCF is thunderstorm. Um, it's a thunderstorm prediction chart. Uh, zoom out. So this is just identifying areas where we're going to see severe thunderstorms. Okay. Um, this is really good to know because typically, uh, if it's a severe thunderstorm, we're just we're not even going to fly near it. So if if ever we're flying through where a TCF is identified, we're always going to see if we can route around it. Sometimes we can't, um, but we're always going to make an attempt to get around the TCF. We don't really want to be flying through those zones. Um, Three nine zero is that flight level? That's the that's the tops of the clouds. That's where they're expecting the top of the clouds to be. So um, you know, a thunderstorm at this uh, at this longitude is that's a pretty severe thunderstorm when your clouds are reaching thirty nine thousand feet. Remember that the higher or further north we go, the um, lower and lower that tropopause is. Uh, and so 39,000 feet, you know, that's, that's a pretty significant convective activity to reach those altitudes. So 
<clears throat> and remember that the CRJ700, the max altitude that we're going to file that at, is going to be 37,000 feet. So we're not going to be able to fly over the top of that storm. Um, and so that's why we want to make sure that we're being cognizant of, you know, where these are, because pilots aren't going to like you too much if you send them through garbage like that, let alone the passengers. No need to make the news. Yeah, but what are the chances we're going to be jump seating with one of those that we have sent? <laughs> yeah, that's true. But they remember names. Believe me, they they do remember names. Uh, they have a bad experience. Pilots, I've, I've noticed something. So a lot of pilots will base one bad experience that they have, like as far as fuel planning goes. There was this one time that I was flying to Salt Lake and it got socked in and they diverted me to Idaho Falls. And when I got to Idaho Falls, that weather was below minimums as well. And I couldn't land there. And then when, or no. So the weather in Salt Lake was bad. Idaho Falls, I had, um, just before I got there, there was somebody that did a gear up landing and closed the runway. So I couldn't get into Idaho Falls. At that point, I only had 30 minutes of fuels and barely made it to Twin Falls. And when I landed at Twin Falls, I had, 15 minutes of fuel left on board. And so from that point on, they want a to see at least 3,000 pounds of fuel on board wherever they land. You know, they base that one bad experience that happened out of the thousands and thousands and thousands of hours that they have of flight time. They will base one bad experience the rest of my flights, I never want to experience that again. So I'm putting in all the cushion I can. And it's like, really think about it. You know, 99.9% .9 of the time, we're never going to have an issue like that. You know, sorry you drew the short st straw that day. You still landed safe. You know, I, you know that sucks. But to penalize every single one of the flights after that because of one bad experience that's it's not really an acceptable excuse <clears throat> you know so uh, anyways i got off on a tangent there i know but but yeah <laughs> These TCFs, though, you definitely want to do your best to plan for fuel to get around them because, you know, you just don't want to to have those issues. Um, so, um, this uh, watches, the watches chart is identifying whether it's going to be a severe thunderstorm or a tornado over a certain period of time. They're expecting um, within the next 24 hours. So, they're expecting a severe thunderstorm to pop up over uh, northern Texas here uh, in southern Oklahoma. So near Oklahoma City. <clears throat> um, and they, they're expecting that to happen at, on the 26th at 0400 Zulu. So bad, bad night. So. So the low level SIG, you, you can see it is a lot like our surface analysis chart and our weather depiction chart. The symbols that you're going to see on this are going to be the same as that or that. And same thing goes with the surface weather uh, prognostic chart. Once again, these charts are very repetitious in the information they display. So <clears throat> we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on, or we're not going to waste time on, on going into each one of those. But this is one I wanted to get to. Um, we looked at this earlier in class. Uh, 
couple weeks ago, but uh, this is what we call winds aloft forecast. So with our winds aloft forecast, um, we can go in here and we can select what altitude, say we plan the flight at 34,000 feet, as you can see up here. This is going to indicate the areas and the temperatures of uh, wind direction and the speed. Okay, so wind direction, speed, and temperature. So the winds in this area um, are going to be coming from the, we always like think of this as a, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it, but basically the winds are coming from this direction and think of it as an arrow. That's that's how I always compared it. Sorry, I was blanking there. So think of it as an arrow and this is the fletching. If you guys have ever shot um, archery before, so or seen Robin Hood, the movie. Okay. Think of it as an arrow and these little wind flags are the fletching. So that is pointing the direction uh, that the wind is going. Okay. So the wind's coming from the west and going to the east um, in this example here. Does that make sense? Does that make it easy for you guys to understand that? It's a great comparison. Yeah. So it's just it's just pointing in the direction that the wind's going, the direction the arrow's flying. So, so each one of these flags here or or sticks um, represents a wind speed. Okay, the longer ones represent ten knots of wind. Okay. The shorter ones represent five knots of wind, and these flags represent 50 knots, okay? So all we need to do when we're looking at, um, when we're looking at these winds aloft charts is we just need to add these up. So we've got 10, 20, 30, 40, five knot winds coming from the west uh, west southwest to the north uh, east or sorry east northeast okay um, and the temperature at 34,000 feet is going to be negative 51 degrees so that's how we read the weather or the winds aloft does anybody need help with that is is there anything I can do to help explain that better? Or any questions? I may have missed this, but did you say what the triangles were? Yeah, so these are 50 knots. 15? 50. Okay. Five, five zero. Oh, 50. All right. Yep. So this would be 50, 60 knot winds. Okay. So let's look at this area here. <clears throat> you guys will notice this big blue blob in the background here. That's identifying the jet stream. These blue marks here identify the jet stream. And as you can see, oops, sorry. Down in the bottom corner here of the chart, depending on the wind speed, it will change color. So we just need to refer to that um, if, if you have questions about it. Um, refer to it. So the lighter blue is 70 knots. The darker blue is 100 knots. The magenta, 150. The purple, 160. 
and the gray is 190 miles an hour or faster, or 190 knots or faster. Okay. So we can see here that the center of this blue blob is 100 plus knots, and outside of it is 70 plus knots. Okay. And to to identify how fast it's going, we just go 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 knots. Okay. So the reason why we would use a winds aloft chart in our flight planning is because let's say that we have a flight going from Chicago here to San Francisco. Okay. Say the what route kind of looks like that. Um, we want to kind of the the computer automatically does this, but let's say the pilot is like, hey, you know, I was planning on the, the winds to be only 25 knots, and right now I'm getting a wind speed of 30 knots. Well, when we look at the wind Wins a loft chart, we go, oh, you're fine because that's actually been forecasted at 30 knots. Um, you know, things like that. Uh, as far as flight planning in the class, you know, maybe we'll see that during, you know, on the route of our flight, let's say we're going San Francisco here to uh, Bozeman, Montana. Okay. Um, when we're flight planning in class, we can see that across the route of our flight, um, the winds are all coming from the north going south, and we're going to average across that that flight path. We're going to average anywhere from a 30 knot uh, wind to a 50 knot wind. So it just gives us a general idea of what the winds are doing at an altitude. Okay. Any questions on the winds aloft chart? When you're flying into a significant headwind, are you uh, adding fuel for something like that? Um, no, because the computer automatically calculates it. Um, and when we're actually doing the flight planning in class, um, we are going to calculate it. <laughs> Uh, we're we're gonna correct for winds, but uh, but before we actually get into the nitty gritty of of doing our IFR flight plan, this is gonna mean a lot more in two weeks, right? But when we're getting into the nitty gritty of the the flight plan, um, before we do that, we take an overview, like we'll we'll do a satellite view of our route. And just be like, or we'll we'll look at some information. We'll be like, well, our average winds are going to be coming from the south, and you know, and that'll just help us get a simplified flight plan put together to where we can take that that information and transfer it onto our IFR flight plan and be pretty close on our our fuel planning. So. Um, so as far as your question goes, the computer's calculating everything as far as the wind goes. It's just <clears throat> the only time that we really care about the wind speed is, is dispatchers is on landing. Um, and we just want to make sure that, you know, we don't have a tailwind or we don't have a too high of a crosswind. And those are the only times that we really care about wind speed or direction. In our flight planning um, at the airlines, so. So this is a high level uh, significant weather pro uh, prognostic chart you can see uh, this just gives us a little bit more information 
Um, these green boxes here are telling us the jet stream, what altitude they're expecting the jet stream, and what speed. Um, you can see the areas identified for, um, so tropical storm has this open center. Hurricane, um, I believe, has a closed center. Um, so you can see where there's volcanoes er uh, erupting. You can see if there's ozone or radiation. Uh, so uh, we never really look at this chart uh, in the dispatch world, but that's also because we're regional airline. Um, in the majors, you may look at it every once in a while, but uh, if you're planning you know, trans-oceanic flights, but um, as far as the regional world, we just don't look at it. <clears throat> and you're going to get a lot of training when you go to the airlines if you do need it. So, yeah. Um, some of the other charts... Uh, so this is showing us the probability of thunderstorms, uh, where we can expect to see thunderstorms. So this is a 12-hour forecast. They're expecting, this is the percentage here. So this yellow area here, 30% chance. The center of that is a 50% chance. Basically, the, the more angry the color, the higher the probability of a thunderstorm. And that pretty much covers it um, as far as charts go. You can see here, these are satellite images. This will show us, um, the satellite images show us echoes. Of uh, When I say echoes, it's a return of precipitation. So think of it as like a radar gun, how when it bounces off a signal, it will return the signal to the radar gun or bounces off something, it returns the signal to the radar gun, and that's what tells the radar gun how fast it's going. Well, this is kind of like a radar gun, but it's, instead of, like, speed, it's identifying uh, precipitation. So these are areas where precipitation's occurring and the intensity that the precipitation's incur uh, occurring um, is all that the uh, satellite image is showing us. Okay. <clears throat> so this is what we call a visible. You can see that this is just showing us what is actually visible from the satellite. This right here um, is the sun, where the sun, uh, you know, where it's dark, where it's light. Uh, the reason why you don't see any clouds over here is because at nighttime, on the dark side of the, the Earth, dark side of the planet, the satellite can't see the clouds. The, so uh, only when there's reflection can the satellite see the clouds. So that's what you see there. <clears throat> And radar. So once again, this is just a radar analysis. It's a lot like what you saw on the satellite uh, infrared inf image, where it's just the echo, the return from the, um, the satellite, but it's using radar instead of infrared. So just a different frequency. And this one will tell us any significant weather. So we can see that it says meso. Uh, this means that there's rotation, um, possibility of, of uh, tornadoes in that area. Um,
but then this is giving us uh, cloud tops as well. 45,000 feet, 40,000 feet, 35,000 feet, 20,000 feet. So it's giving this the tops. This right here is identifying <laughs> the speed at which the storm is moving. Okay. So 19 knots, you can see 31 knots there, 27 knots there, 27 knots there. So. Yeah. Any questions on any of this? <laughs> Want me to go back and take a look at something or? All right. So let's, uh, for your homework today, or for this long weekend, I've got, uh, I'll be posting worksheets number three and four in here. We already went over number two. Um, <clears throat> but then I want you guys to also look at these video links here. Okay. All these video links that are in there. I want you guys to watch those. Those will give you um, information about the different um, charts that we uh, looked at. And then this has also got links to Adam's classes. Um, so, yeah, this one, Aviation Services, uh, this one's the same as the first one, but it starts with charts rather than starting off with the textual. So, really, this is the main one I want you guys to watch, this bottom one. Um, this other stuff this is this will be good for you guys um to review like i said before at the beginning class it's good to hear it from multiple different teachers um, adam may cover something better than i covered it and you may get a little more insight into certain aspects of uh, of the weather and reading these charts so Um, any questions? All right. Well, then I will let you guys go uh, for your long weekend. So. <laughs>